Hey, good morning, y'all. Josh's severe weather. I've got a ton of stuff to talk about today's video, and we are looking at some extreme weather for the month of January. And yesterday, just a prime example of some things that I don't think we've really ever seen in our lifetime here. Just some insane, insane stuff happening. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to share my screen with you, uh, and uh, you will see exactly what I am talking about. Extreme weather, and I think that may even be an understatement. Yesterday afternoon, tornadoes occurred in parts of eastern Iowa near Williamsburg, or was it Williamston, and uh, Cedar Rapids. And this is only the second occurrence on record of tornadoes in the month of January in Iowa. I think the last time was in the 60s, um, and that was actually a major outbreak. This one, not a major outbreak, but nonetheless, something that a lot of us have never seen. Next, we had a yellow area designated by the National Hurricane Center. They decided not to do much with it. However, I'm going to argue with them that maybe something should have been done. Uh, and that is that we had an unnamed subtropical storm, the Invest 90L, that was off the East Coast. Uh, not a bomb cyclone, but one that intensified pretty quickly over the Gulf Stream, never really became tropical. Now it's heading up into eastern Nova Scotia and weakening. All right, we're going to talk about the South. We've had some strong tornadoes last week, and we've got more southern tornadoes likely here in the next couple of episodes. Um, the map here shown is actually going to be over the weekend and early next week. There's a storm before it I'm going to talk about. And then finally, on the East Coast, you're asking, where in the world is the snow? We've had like little to nothing. Well, I will say that we see some shifting in the weather coming here starting next week, and the potential for snow on the East Coast, while certainly not a slam dunk, it is starting to grow finally, and we may not escape with no snow this winter. So a lot to talk about. If you could subscribe to my channel, I'm going to, of course, go into more details. I'm going to have to speculate some. That is my job as a meteorologist. However, I'm going to give you the science behind everything so you can at least see what we're looking at. And then, of course, you can you can be the judge yourself. You can use your free apps and they're going to tell you some wild stuff or you can get it here for me, an expert who's got over 20 years of meteorology under my belt. And I do this for a living. All right, so let's look at Iowa first. Here are the reports from tornadoes yesterday. And I'm going to show you the Storm Prediction Center pretty much dropped the ball on this one. And there's some reasoning why. And I'm not picking on NOAA. Um, I know there's, I have friends that have done it, people I've worked with in the past. They all work hard. Uh, but in my opinion, this is something that some of us had seen before. Reed Timmer actually talked about it how there was a low chance, kind of a conditional probability of some tornadoes forming. And the reason why, there was strong wind shear uh, with the cyclone that moved through the upper Midwest yesterday. There wasn't enough moisture, though, for this to really be a big event. However, um, there was some damage out of it. I'm going to show you guys what it looked like. Uh, this is one image I found on Twitter. I'm sorry, I don't know who took it, so I can't give credit where credit is due. But uh, you can see a pretty low top tornado, not a major one, but one, if it's coming at you, you obviously need to take cover. Um, here's another image from Joseph Marino, where you can see on the other side of the tornado, uh, obviously a rapidly, vi uh, a rapidly uh, rotating column of air. You can see the lowering cloud heights here and what looks like probably some lightning strikes coming out of this part. And there was some damage done. Um, I really hope this person's okay, but a semi was flipped in the tornado. This is from uh, Iowa DOT, one of their cameras on Interstate 80 going westbound yesterday afternoon at 252. So... Uh, this is definitely a situation I believe should have been warned. And if you take a look at the Storm Prediction Center outlook yesterday morning, uh, this was the first outlook of the day. You could see they did, they were expecting a chance for thunderstorms, but a less than 2% chance of any tornadoes. Uh, later on, towards lunchtime, there was a, mar a marginal risk um, that was introduced, and the tornadoes occurred here in the western part of that region and a 2% chance of a tornado, which actually is not a terribly bad forecast. The only problem is this, this, this was issued less than an hour before the tornadoes happened. And I don't know about you, but I like to be warned when something's gonna hit me that could certainly, um, certainly cause me to lose property and maybe even put myself in danger. So in my opinion, the Storm Prediction Center could have done a much better job here. And I'm not slamming them. That's not my goal of this video. It's just to let you know that uh, so far this month, We've already had severe weather. We've had tornadoes. We've had deaths. In my opinion, they could have done a, maybe a better job of forecasting these events, um, getting out the point that certainly uh, people's lives can be in danger. There was um, a mesoscale discussion issued yesterday afternoon at 219 as the tornado was on the ground saying there was a local risk for a brief tornado. 
And that's one of those things where, okay, if anybody's even reading this, it's already happened. So uh, near Williamsburg, Iowa. So I guess that's better than nothing. Let's at least acknowledge it. But really, aside from that, just not not enough was done, in my opinion. And Iowa City, University of Iowa is over here. Um, classes are back in session. Fortunately, that cell stayed north and west, went in between major population centers. But if this had been over here or over here, uh, in my opinion, and obviously I don't wish any harm on anyone, but in my opinion, it could have been a lot worse. And I'm thank God it wasn't. Let's just say that, okay? All right, on to the next situation that got acknowledged, but <laughs> in my opinion, did not was not acknowledged well enough. I'm done picking on Norman. Let's pick on Miami now. <laughs> Gosh, National Hurricane Center, Miami. Uh, I hope they were awake yesterday. Um, there was an invest that was designated that just basically means an area we're watching. We're going to run a model on it to see what happens and. Not a serious situation, trust me, not a serious situation, unless you're on a ship out there. But what we saw uh, was, uh, in fact, not, not a warm core, but a, a starting to warm core subtropical storm yesterday. It didn't last forever, uh, basically a one day event, but I will show you the satellite loop. Here is the, uh, the goes with the uh, lightning strike flash count. And, and you see lightning strikes here and a bit of an eye wall forming, definitely a closed off low. Uh, this was uh, early yesterday. Um, but basically, winds of 50 miles per hour uh, were recorded along with thunder and lightning here um, on the western side of this circulation. If you take a look here at the satellite image from yesterday, you can actually see what appears to be an eye and an eye wall forming with thunderstorm tops around it. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the ocean water temperatures do not support a fully tropical system at this time. But my question is, why in the world was there not um an advisory issued on this why was there not a name given to this being a subtropical storm with 50 knot winds that's 58 miles per hour um even though the storm is now weakening you can kind of see that as it goes over the colder water opening up and heading into the eastern part of nova scotia um people on on the eastern part of nova scotia are getting tropical storm force wind this morning as i cut this video and over the water the storm was more impressive because it was warmer here and was not getting as much wind shear as it is today so I've seen blobs get a name like Colin uh, last July that hit South Carolina. There's a tropical storm warning for Wilmington, North Carolina, cried out loud for something that was no worse than a summer thunderstorm. Um, so I do have a bone to pick with NOAA here uh, with the National Hurricane Center. And um, they did issue, actually, I'll show you guys here. I need to type it in. They did issue the Red X saying no additional special tropical weather outlooks are scheduled for this system. Uh, but basically, the the um, outlook that came out yesterday was at like 10 in the morning. And at that point, we've already had tropical storm like conditions. So again, if this is how it's going to be, folks, I challenge you, NOAA, National Weather Service, National Hurricane Center, Storm Prediction Center, challenge you to push yourself a little bit harder this year because we're already seeing extreme weather. All right. So I'm done with them. Let's move on to the future here. We've got a major winter storm forming here in Colorado. Uh, we've seen lots of snow across parts of the mountains of Arizona, snow squalls yesterday in southwestern Utah. That storm is evolving northeastward and will bring a heavy snowfall into northeastern Colorado, parts of Nebraska, northwest Kansas, and we'll see that snow extending all the way into Wisconsin. Um, actually, this is going to be a heavy snowfall for some in here. Uh, so um, this area does get a lot of winter storms, but not really in the middle of January. So this is going to be a little bit unusual storm track. Uh, right across the uh, center of the country and moving northeast. We do have winter storm watches out for the upper Midwest, as well as the interior of New York, upstate Pennsylvania, and parts of Vermont as well. Um, but this is not going to be a big northeast snowstorm. What we're talking about here, let me move on, <clears throat> is a pretty intense upper level low uh, tracking into the west, a deep trough, and a closed off low in eastern Colorado. That this is this morning, or this is actually tomorrow morning. So here's where we are right now. The upper low is in Arizona, uh, but is going to eject northeastward. You'll see a very tight uh, gradient here between the upper low and a ridge over the eastern U.S. So some very strong winds here uh, over the deep south. This will likely spawn some severe weather tomorrow, and especially tomorrow evening across parts of the deep south. It'll also produce a very heavy area of snow just to the north and west of that upper low track. It's going to go up into the upper Great Lakes and then kind of get sheared out eastward and then east southeastward and where it ends up will determine where the heavy snow can develop here in the northeast. I think it's going to be mostly away from the coast from New York City on southward 
Uh, but from Boston on north and west, we could see a significant snow. That is going to move out of here. It's going to warm right back up. And yet another strong trough digs all the way down into Texas over the weekend. And this will pick up Gulf moisture and likely produce more heavy rain in the south and possibly severe weather, especially right in the uh, Gulf Coast region this time and also Alabama and Georgia once again. And you'll see behind it another upper low. This is dropping south. And um, the good news for California is that this is going east of you. So this is a dry northerly flow, not a wet westerly or southwesterly flow. Uh, but you can see how far south the GFS takes it and tries to phase it with the northern branch trough. There's definitely colder air coming in. You can see these lines out of the north here pushing the cold air into the upper Midwest. So it is getting colder next week. Um, the big question mark, are these two systems going to phase together? Uh, if they do, we could have a big storm in the northeast. Right now, it doesn't look like that'll be the case. Uh, the GFS actually is a bit extreme here in taking this upper level trough down south which means we could have another Appalachian snowstorm, maybe something to watch here in the Mid-Atlantic region as well uh, for the middle of next week before that moves out. And yet another trough here across uh, the central and southern United States at the end of the month. By then, we've got a cold look coming. And this is just one model run of the GFS. The European, I'm going to show you that. Um, the European, oops, let me go back one here. The European model is uh, not... Um, dropping quite as far to the south and east. And I apologize, I've got some stuff going on in the background here. If you hear that, uh, sounds like my kid is up. All right, so the GFS Ensemble here uh, shows the chance for significant rain across the uh, Ohio River Valley here on Thursday, and that will move away, and then more heavy rain across the deep south here over the weekend, and this is where we could have some severe weather as well. So definitely a likelihood of significant precipitation. This heads up the East Coast, by the way, so maybe some snow over parts of coastal Maine. That moves out, and we've got yet an increased chance to see more storminess across the eastern United States. I'm going to show you all the GFS operational. This is not an official forecast, but it does show significant snow over the upper Midwest here and then spreading into New England Thursday into Friday. That moves off the coast. And then over the weekend, we have another storm system bringing heavy rain to parts of the south and east and heavy snow to Chicago, finally here, if this model is right. Now, it could, it could end up farther north and west, meaning we miss another snowstorm in Chicago, or it could end up farther south and east, meaning Indianapolis and Cincinnati may see some snow. So again, a little bit too soon to make any call, uh, but nonetheless, another major storm. It looks like another big rain event here for the east coast, maybe some stronger, severe weather over parts of the southeast here at the end of the weekend and early part of next week. After that moves out, you can see a colder look coming and uh, we see uh, low pressure forming here over the Western Gulf, meaning uh, we could still have severe weather, but now Florida and the Central Gulf Coast will likely see some potential for at least heavy rain, if not severe weather by Tuesday and Wednesday. If these two phase, we have a big East Coast storm that doesn't look like it's gonna happen at this point, but it does look like the chance for snow starts to pick up. And this is kind of extreme. The GFS has low pressure all the way off the Carolina coast, meaning uh, we could have winter weather in North Carolina and Virginia and the Del Marva. Actually, this would miss the big cities of the Northeast. Wouldn't that be injustice? However, being one model run and being so far out in advance, we're talking over a week out, um, there's definitely not a guarantee that we have a winter storm in the mid-Atlantic. If anything, this low could be over New York City and it's across the interior of the Northeast. But something I'm definitely watching, and I not noticed that uh, storm system behind it um, will pick up some cold air and moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and that could mean an East Coast storm as we start February. But again, this is 384 hours in advance. The GFS has shown several of these before. It has kind of swung and missed before it shot a lot of bricks. And we've ended up seeing this low pressure track ending up here in western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio, meaning rain for the big cities. So I'm showing it to you now not to hype it up, but to show you that there's now at least some growing potential that we could have some form of an east coast storm followed by yet another east coast storm. Where it ends up going is going to, of course, determine the precipitation type. Let's look more at this severe weather chance because I think it's important uh, we will have severe weather across the deep south here. Um, if you go to the day three outlook, whoops, day two, that is tomorrow, there is a slight risk for severe weather um, all the way up to western Kentucky and down into Louisiana and east Texas. This is a slight risk. I do think there's some potential that this could have 
an upgrade coming to enhance risk, but a lot of it's going to determine on the timing and the amount of instability that's in place. I think there will be some tornadoes in here. If we look at the day two tornado outlook, it is up to 5%. That's what last week's was a day out before it got bumped up to 10%. So um, there's definitely a chance for tornadoes, and I think the worst of it will come at night over southeastern Arkansas, northeastern Louisiana, and western Mississippi. And nighttime tornadoes, of course, um, lead to, typically speaking, more fatalities than daytime tornadoes as people are sleeping. So if you're in this region, you need to be on your toes for tomorrow. Now, day three, the combined outlook is definitely looking more promising when it comes to avoiding severe weather, but I don't think that it's not possible. I talked about the last couple of days, the threat for severe weather over eastern Alabama, western Georgia, maybe northwestern Florida. But right now, the Storm Prediction Center just has a marginal risk. They are not expecting a repeat of last week. Um, I'm kind of in between the two. I think there will be some tornadoes and some strong winds, and that could extend all the way up into Ohio and West Virginia, the strong wind threat, because our low is actually moving quickly northeast. Uh, but there will be a band of stronger winds aloft that I think could still produce some isolated severe weather, I think mainly in the morning, though. And we see the low kind of being separated from the instability, and that, of course, is not a favorable sign if you want to see tornadoes. Of course, we don't. Uh, but um, this is something I'll be monitoring. If there's any timing differences and this ends up being slower, we could have at least a slight risk in this region. Um, the SIPS certainly shows that there's a 15% chance of severe weather, but it's not keen on tornadoes occurring. It's a very small chance for tornadoes. It's mainly thinking this would be a severe wind event with broken uh, a broken squall line crossing Georgia and heading into South Carolina, maybe even North Carolina, as we get into Thursday evening. So that's the area I'm going to watch here for watches and warnings. Um, the next storm system has a pretty good chance of producing severe weather as well. Uh, we see about five or six states covered by the threat for severe weather. This is for um, the 23rd, which is, this will actually be Sunday, ending the 23rd, Monday morning. So Sunday, a potential severe weather event. And um, we do have a threat for some tornadoes, not so much for hail. Um, but something I'll be watching here, two 15% areas for the day on Sunday. Um, the day before, the uh, threat for severe weather is pretty minimal, but definitely Sunday, I'm going to be watching for the potential for severe wind and maybe some tornadoes uh, across the central and eastern Gulf Coast states and maybe sneaking into the Carolinas as well. Uh, let's look at the uh, next 24 hours. The significant tornado parameter stays low until we get into tomorrow afternoon. This is 1 o'clock central. And we do see the threat for some thunderstorms forming over East Texas, Northwest Louisiana, and Southern Arkansas. And there is some chance for an, a significant tornado to form before we get into the nighttime hours when the threat starts to weaken. The supercell composite, though, that is the, um, it, it combines uh, instability and wind shear, um, still has some chance for some severe weather carrying on through the nighttime into Mississippi. Uh, but right now, the NAM is thinking that the afternoon is going to be our busiest uh, stretch of weather here uh, Wednesday afternoon before things slowly relax Wednesday night. And then as we head into Alabama and Georgia, the parameters start dropping until Thursday morning when southeastern Alabama and the panhandle of Florida and southwest Georgia are under the gun. So I'm thinking if the NAM is right, our biggest chance for severe weather is tomorrow afternoon in the Arklatex, maybe early tomorrow night in the Arkla Miss kind of jumps over and then we see kind of a second surge over southeast Alabama, the panhandle of Florida and southwest Georgia uh, towards late morning and into lunchtime on Thursday. But we are seeing the up, the uh, low pressures up here and the instabilities down here. We're not seeing the two really connect, which is good news as we really don't want to see any severe weather. The outlook starts looking colder here. All the above average temperatures we've had this month with the line about here stretches east. And now we're looking at near average temperatures during climatologically our coldest time of the year in the Northeast. So this is definitely um, something more promising for winter weather and chillier air extending to the Eastern US. It's still gonna be warm across Florida and the Southeast, but it does turn cooler as we get to the very end of January. It'll be a cold second half of January though across the Rockies and the West. You see all that snow coming through, uh, but definitely a pattern change coming for us, not an extreme one, the one that will gradually turn colder here next week. The GFS has our big snowstorm stretching from the Four Corners region into Iowa. We could have a foot or more of snow across portions of Nebraska. That heads up into Michigan and mostly avoids Milwaukee and Chicago. 
Uh, the next storm behind it produces some snow where we had tornadoes yesterday in Iowa and some snow maybe in the Chicagoland area, but not yet to Indianapolis on Sunday. It's just a little bit too close to the north and west to really avoid any significant snow. That heads out, and now we see a more southern storm track. I don't know if that's going to work out or not, but we could see some snow showers, maybe some light snow all the way into parts of the Mid-South here next week. Uh, but again, now with it being 10 days out, the certainty level certainly drops off. And you can see a fantasy storm on the GFS over Texas and Oklahoma here at the beginning of February. Not sure that's going to play out. Uh, let's look at the eastern United States, though, real quick. I will show you guys that, and we'll wrap things up. I'll come back to that. That was a tease. Uh, but we see our northeast snowstorm here at the end of the week, mainly New England, not really the big cities of the northeast. Um, and then the next storm comes through here on Sunday and into Monday. It's an eastern Canada special and maybe maybe northern Maine. But Michigan could see significant snow right around the top of the thumb here, as well as into the Chicagoland area. Uh, and some snow in the mountains early next week as it finally starts turning colder after what will be a warm weekend here in the southeast. Next week, now the GFS shows um, a major snowfall for North Carolina and Virginia. I'm not really buying it. The model run before it does not show that storm doing it. In fact, it's got it up across New England. So again, no run to run consistency. The run before it is in between the two over Pennsylvania and the Ohio Valley. So again, no consistency at this point, but uh, definitely showing an increasing chance for an East Coast storm. Uh, and that's what I'll be watching for you. The, the GFS last night looks great for like Philadelphia, Baltimore, DC and Southern New England. Uh, but then if you expand it to the latest run, we don't see that showing. Uh, we do see another storm that comes through the Carolinas and into Maryland and Virginia, but um, it's way too soon to make any calls on if we're going to have a big storm. I just think that potential is starting to grow, though, based on the colder weather pattern that we're heading into. So who had strong southern tornadoes, a subtropical storm, Iowa tornadoes, record California rain and snow, and extreme heat in Europe and southern flooding for January on their board this year? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you what, there is a support group if you're a snowplow driver in the Northeast. Um, and I think some of these guys were playing golf over in Iowa yesterday before the tornadoes, of course, hit. So I appreciate y'all's time. If you could subscribe to my channel for the latest, I've given you a lot of information today. I'm going to break it down and give you more detail. We're going to narrow down and pin down where that snow may fall here next week in the east. And if you could like this and share with your friends, I would very much appreciate that. Um, I, I want to give God all the glory for what he has given me. That's the gift to forecast and share with you all and help save lives. Um, I really do appreciate those that work with uh, NOAA, with the National Weather Service, the Hurricane Center and Storm Prediction Center. They save lives and they do a great job. I'm not picking on them today. I just think some choices maybe could have been a little bit different. Um, but I, I'm not going to be super critical um, anymore. I just don't think it's, it's what I've been called to do. And, um, you know, I, 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 I recognize that we all sin and that many of us are believers and many are not. And I'm not the person to judge that. But what I will say is that I stay in the word every day. If you go to John 1, 1 through 5, the word became flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I know God's a baseball fan because otherwise we wouldn't have a big inning in the first place. But the word is Jesus Christ. That is what he's that is what he is. Uh, what John is saying, the word was Jesus Christ. He was with God in the big inning. through him. All things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And my, my commission to you is, do you want to be the light that shines in the darkness? Do you want to be the person who, who believes, who has faith, who sees eternal glory through God, through the word, through Jesus Christ? Or do you want to continue to be dark and live in the darkness and not be overcome and not have eternal life and not have eternal future? To me, it means a lot. And I just challenge you to to do what I did when I was about 30 years old and say, look, I'm not necessarily a seeker, but I want to see, I want to see a favorable outcome. I want to, I want to have eternal life. How do I do that? So I got in the word. I learned about Jesus Christ. And now 10 years later, I'm sharing that word with you. I really appreciate your time today. Um, I am running a fundraiser for St. Baldrick's foundation. Not going to shave my head, but my beard is gone. 
on March 18th. And I'm asking you if you could to spare a little bit of money for childhood cancer research, because every two minutes a child is diagnosed with cancer. And that is uh, near and dear to me, having friends who've lost children to cancer. It's just obviously something uh, that's very difficult to process, but I wanna do what I can. And that is to spread the word um, that I am running this fundraiser and that I would love to raise at least a thousand dollars. So I appreciate y'all's time today. Uh, God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful day. Please be safe and we'll talk again tomorrow. Take care.